Hey everybody, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Fight Bros Podcast. It's me, JB, the Ultimate Writer, and today I am catching up with Dan the Hangman Hooker. He's his very own UFC fighter, uh, and one of my favourite fighters. Now, um, tell us what it is you love about spending time in Thailand, especially at Tiger Muay Thai, and why you find yourself being drawn back there time and time again. Um, here I'm just surrounded by a, a bunch of hungry, young innovative guys you know and we more than having a coach just standing there saying do this 100 push-ups blah 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 you've got to do this i'm surrounded by a bunch of intelligent guys and we just feed off each other you know one will have oh i have an idea i think we should start moving in this direction and then we can have a discussion and feed off each other and oh i don't i'm not sure about that like i think you know, so it's it, there's a lot of interaction. I think it's a lot it's a lot better environment for me. It it keeps me motivated. It keeps me hungry being surrounded by all these hungry young guys. You know, yes. as opposed to just going into a gym, being told being told what to do. Like I think I was um, very independent for so long and and figured out a lot of things on my own. Then it's it's hard for me to just get told this is this is the way to do it and and don't ask any don't ask any questions you know now you know Saeed will come in and he'll say hey we're gonna do three rounds of this and I'll say okay yep but why and then he'll have to explain why we're doing it and then I'll start picking it apart and he can explain it and so it's yeah it's a real creative environment and I guess that's that's the best and we all we all just demand excellence. We demand perfection, yeah. which is the thing. I, I demand perfection in myself, and per- perfection's what you have to be aspiring to to really achieve anything in the sport. So it's the environment here. Just and it, I look forward to getting up every day with this environment, which is exactly what you need. It keeps me hungry. Yeah. Being here keeps me on my toes. Uh, nothing great was ever achieved in a comfort zone. For sure. If, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah. In New Zealand, if, if I'm sitting back on the couch, you know, I, I'm comfortable. Yeah. And when I'm comfortable, I, I start getting nervous because that's not when I, I perform my best. Yeah. I perform my best outside of my comfort zone where I'm constantly being tested, questioned, and uh, evolved. Awesome. Nice. Um, so, uh, so sticking with the training, so you recently spent time in the US at Elevation Flight Team and um, famously crashed on Neil Magny's couch for a bit, and you became <laughs> good friends with Drew Dober as well. Just um, tell us a little bit about that period and some of the major things you were able to take away from it. Yeah, um, it, it, it was something, that was that was kind of one of the things I had on my bucket list, you know. Yeah. I've, I've heard my entire career that uh, you know the training in the US is the best. The training, the training is like on another level. So I, I really had to go and see for myself, you know. Um, so I went there. I I kind of just dropped everything. I I just took off there. Spent four months in in Denver at Team Elevation, yeah. and it was it was a really great growth experience. The coaches there were amazing. The training partners were, you know, world class. They have all the, all the big name guys. You know, I got to train with all, you know, Donald Cerrone, uh, Matt Brown, Neil Magny, yeah. TJ Dillashaw, like world champions. And just going there and seeing for yourself is an experience like nothing else. Awesome. I've always told other fighters or told myself like, get out, you know, see see the world. Like, there's so many different styles in the world. If you stay in the one place, you're only gonna really experience the one style, and it's gonna hold you back. If you if you move and just work with different guys, and like I was saying, it uh, uh, about being uncomfortable, yeah. being uncomfortable with different styles is when I perform my best. You know, if I'm in the same place for too long, yeah. uh, I kind of get stir crazy or or stagnant in a way. But every fighter is different, you know. Some some fighters might work their find their winning magic, and that they they kind of stick with that. Neil Neil's got his winning magic in Denver, you know. He he works with these great coaches, and that that works for him, and that's got him constantly evolving, you know. So that's really the the perfect mix for Neil, and he's there, and he's he's got his 
routine and he's kind of working through that whereas me i i, I need that constant change it keeps it keeps me sharp and it keeps me on edge nice it's like um like you know there's a poem called the hangman it's about a traveling hangman it's kind of you know it kind of mirrors your life you know you travel around and just collect knowledge <laughs> instead of taking lives and things like that well you know you almost take lives in the cage and stuff but it's just a real cool um thing that you do now um something obviously real big news Mark Hunt uh, has been incredibly vocal about Brock Lesnar, UFC, PEDS, etc. Um, after UFC 200. Uh, it seems that he hasn't got a lot of support from the roster, even some noted uh, critics in the past like Michael Bisping, um, etc. Do you have a stance on that? Um, and, you know, would you like to see uh, something which has been talked about recently, which would be a fighters union? Yeah, that's a... Uh... I suppose it is a tough one for you to, to speak openly about, you know, because, you know, you're an employee, so, so you know, it's understandable. But, you know, if you have any sort of thoughts on it that you wanted to put out there. Yeah, that's, that is a tough one from, from my perspective. It's a different perspective. You know, I have another 20 years with this company. And, that's um... right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have a big future, and my, my future that I have set myself is with this company. And one thing I've always had is I've never had, I've never let things like that distract me from my, my ultimate goal. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the Jose Aldo comment. Uh, he said, money is, money is like a ghost. He says, when you, when, you start, when you start trying to catch it, uh, yeah. you get stuck but if you just move forward then it follows you yeah so that's that's the way I've I've treated the sport the whole time I've seen so many fighters get distracted with promotions and 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 sponsorships sure. you know they they get disheartened they're like man I've been trying to get sponsorships uh and they let it dishearten them so they don't have fights or they have an argument with it. Oh man, this promoter didn't pay me what I'm, he was going to pay me. So, you know, I, I kind of just build myself as a great fighter and a developed fighter. And what comes with that is, you know, if I get money, I get sponsorships. These are, these are added bonuses to me. Yeah. But living this lifestyle competing in the cage and trying to be the best fighter in the world those are my those take up 99.9 percent .9 of my my focus and my priority my focus and my priority is being the best fighter in the world and living my lifestyle and enjoying my lifestyle all these other things i feel they, they shouldn't be they shouldn't be factors to a young guy uh looking to be a fighter you know i ha i hear this so many times people message me oh yeah i'm just gonna sort my money situation out and then i'm gonna become a professional fighter yeah. if if money is a priority to you then you're in the wrong game mate if <laughs> people have asked me they say oh what would you be doing if if you weren't a fighter i said oh well you know i i was studying business school i'd probably be doing a good job earning some good money if I spent the amount of time that I spend on this sport and the amount of focus and passion into this sport, I guarantee you I would be a millionaire by now. But I don't. I train. I spend all day in the gym. I spend all day thinking about this sport, watching fights. Like yeah. this, this, this sport and this passion is my motivation. So I will never let money or these outside things focus on me. Uh, distract me you know yeah. where I am now I'm, I'm living my lifestyle and I'm, I'm working towards my goal and that is that is my ultimate focus so to let these other things distract me or dishearten me uh, is is it would be foolish to, to follow to follow these things or let them dishearten my my passion for the sport yeah, perfect. No, that, that's yeah, that's that's understandable. And it's an incredibly healthy um, mindset to have because you know, like you say, everything other than fighting, if you're a fighter, is effectively a distraction. So, you know, that's the best way to be about it. I think. Um, now, 
who on the UFC roster, past or present, uh, would you love to train with? Uh, you know, if you had six months and someone was like, you can go anywhere, train with anyone, who would you choose? I'd, I'd love to... Uh, you hear so much about Greg Jackson or Farah Sahabi, I'd love to put work in with him. Uh, or Dana Hewer, see, uh, yeah. see what his jiu-jitsu skills or his jiu-jitsu training being a New Zealander, you know, that would be yeah. one of the one of the elites to work with and um yeah working with danny hill would be great greg jackson would be you know a mastermind i'd love to just get in there and kind of pick his brain for us sahabi you hear so much about he's a very knowledgeable guy but yeah just to spend some time at their camps and be able to pick their brains i think would be uh invaluable yeah awesome yeah no that's great um now, what, what sort of things have you got coming up for you? Um, obviously, you're in Thailand at the moment. Have you got uh, anything, you know, sort of like uh, camp spots that you might be doing in the future? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm training here, and we're, we're always working on things, and I'm always... Uh, even, I, anything fight-related, I'm, I'm always focusing on. Um, what we've been doing now is been putting I was first I was doing some breakdown videos and having them online and I was really just enjoying that yeah. um that was good. breaking down fights and kind of giving giving it from my perspective uh what I've been doing lately is I've been putting together a strength and condition well my strength and conditioning program I've been making a video series on my strength what I do for strength and conditioning because I was thinking and I get asked so many times from young fighters or coaches like you know what do you do what do you do because I've worked I've been so many different places and worked with some of the best minds in the sport I really do have a lot of knowledge on these topics and I've I've figured them out through trial and error you know I've done a million different things and so I'm I'm confident I know what works so I've been putting together my strength and conditioning training, you know, what I do for running, what I do for weights, like what I do, how many times a week, putting it to video, and we've, we've really just been putting that together now, and we'll have that up in a, in a couple of weeks. Awesome. Um, so young fighters and young coaches can um, feed off that knowledge and really save themselves a lot of time. Yeah, that's right, because, you know, you guys and yourself, you know, you've done so much hard, of the hard work for people that, you know, they can really just save themselves a lot of heartache and a lot of time and, and just feed off your knowledge in a similar way that you guys feed off other people's knowledge. I caught some of your breakdown videos that you did with Kai Kara France and stuff. They were entertaining and, like, you know, your guys' technical analysis was great. Um, speaking of him uh, coming up to the Ultimate Fighter, um, what do you know about the, this uh, coming season and things like that? You know, any anything that you can, any light that you can shed on that process, or anything that you know from him, or that you know yourself from uh, your contacts in the UFC. Yeah, Kai, Kai is in the house. Yeah. Uh, as we speak, I think he'll be. He left damn near a month ago, so he'll be he'll be halfway through the season. So there'll be three weeks into filming right now. Yeah. So. You know, as we know, as soon as you leave, you they give their phone away, and we lose yeah. all contact with them. So, I, I'm I'm very nervous at the moment, but I've I've had a look through at some of the other guys, and I, I don't see any of them giving him too much trouble. You know, the skills that Kai has, and I've, we've prepared him for this for the last how many years, you know, and I, I'm confident he has the skill set to not only do well in the house, but take this show out. So as we're watching, I'm going to be watching very excited. Uh, by now, Kai would have probably run through his second guy by knockout. So fingers crossed, man. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, that's great. Obviously, we all wish him the best. Um, and, you know, it's going to be great to see another Kiwi on the Ultimate Fighter and um, one that, you know, he's been ripping it up recently. And you guys have obviously had a lot of input with that. Uh, another Kiwi that you've been training with is the Stylebender, Israel Adesanya. Obviously, you guys, um, watching you guys sparring together is just like watching guys who know each other so well. You know, every move, every look that you guys have has an intention and stuff, and you guys just look like you're having so much fun when you, you're throwing down together. Just, um, you know, tell, tell people a little bit about um, what it's like to have some of your close bros out there with you. 
Yeah, that was cool, man. I, I haven't trained with uh, Izzy since before Denver. So that was our, that was, and, and he only stopped through Thailand for a week. And it was the one sparring session. So, um, nah, that was really cool. It's That's kind of how we catch up. Yeah. You know, that's how we catch up and we, we get to check each other's, we get to check I had five months, so for him come in, oh, we got sparring today, you know, it was round one, and I just went over, you know, me and Izzy grabbed each other, and it's, it's time to see if you got any better, man, he's trying to see if I've got any better, and we just kind of, yeah, that's how we have fun, man, that's how we say hello, so it, yeah. that was that was awesome, and I didn't realize it was, it was caught on video until that came out a month <laughs> later, which was pretty cool, and they made a little highlight video out of it, so now nah, that was awesome, man. Nice, nice. Um, cool. So, um, you know, in terms of fights, uh, have you got anything in the works? Uh, what's coming up for you? And um, you know, obviously, um, where would you want to be? What would what would you want your next fight to be, or the fight after that? I guess I'm on the next show in November in Australia. That would be my my best bet. We haven't we haven't heard anything yet, or they haven't they haven't announced that show so far. But I'm um, I'm hedging my bets that I'm on that card in the November card in Australia, be it Sydney or Melbourne. Um, I've heard it's 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 one of those. So Sydney and Melbourne in November, watch out. Uh, and I'll I'll definitely be on that card. And man, I'm 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 itching to get back out there, man. I'm just thinking about it every day, you know. Uh, this amount of time between fights is just, I'm, I'm too hungry to get back in there and, and compete and show my skills and show my improvements. Because I think since since my last fight, man, they, they should have fought me a month after that. They should have fought me then because they're letting this time go past and I'm only getting better every day. So the next guy is, he's in a lot of trouble, man. Nice, nice, awesome. So, um. Well, that's, that's all the questions I sort of had for you. Is there anything that you wanted to chat about? Um, did you want to maybe talk about some of the fights from the weekend, if you caught those? Yeah, oh man, there have been some great fights even um, since 200. Woodley yeah. was a bit of a shock. Uh, I didn't think it would, it would happen quite so quickly. But he did some... Leading up to the fight, they were saying his lead right hand is his, you know, his number one weapon, is his number one... Uh, danger, and I think Lawler just underestimated that uh, that early athleticism and his, and his distance. So distance in training and then distance in a fight is is a bit different. So I tend to give myself more distance from the start of the fight because everyone has that explosive power when, when they start a fight. So inspiring, you might be at a safe range, but when someone's 100% and they've got that nervous energy, you know, they might be able to add an extra couple of inches to their punch. And a couple of inches in the fight game is the difference between, well, an inch is the difference between a punch missing and a punch hitting you on the chin. Yeah. So Lola underestimating that, that well, not giving himself enough range to start the fight and uh, you know he paid the he paid the price he paid the ultimate price um i would have liked to see a few rounds and seen that fight go a bit deeper but that was a shock man yeah. rose number units really impressed me you know she lost that fight but i think she was doing some great things and she's got a big future that round one her footwork in round one yeah. she would have just stayed stayed composed and kept moving that man i, I was kind of losing my shit watching her <laughs> jumping around the ring and watching her footwork man i was i was thinking i wanted to make a film study on her footwork because that's the best footwork i'd seen all night yeah. and I, I was losing my shit about it man she's circling out she's faint to uh, cutting angles man that was that was really impressive for me another one uh the main event before that shevchenko versus home because uh shevchenko is from she's trained out at tiger muay thai Oh, sure. And uh, and I I've seen her in the gym and she's a beast like grappling wise she's you know gives a lot of high level guys 
uh, ass whooping, standing up, she's just on a completely different level, man. You see her working with her coaches, and she puts together a 17-time Muay Thai world champ. She's, she's, it's good to see her performing the way she can perform, you know. Uh, beating Holly wasn't luck, you know. That's something that I've seen. Um, that wasn't luck at all. Like that, that's her like skill and her. She did. She outclassed Holly on the feet. Took her down, which a lot of people didn't expect, and she uh, classed her on the ground. So her ability. She is a five round fighter, you know. So when she does get to those championship fights, she's going to be very hard to beat. You know, Amanda Nunes beat her in a close fight over three rounds two more rounds i don't think amanda beats her i think holly uh i think um shevchenko really picks nunez apart round four and five so hopefully she gets that rematch in a five rounder and i think she takes the belt you know which would be which would be great so yeah man there have been some amazing fights we got some amazing fights coming up with McGregor, a Nate. couple of new champions uh, here and there, and yeah, it's it's pretty. Crazy. Oh, they're about to. What is it? Eight, eight new champions this year. So there's eight champions yet to defend their title. Yeah, and there's you know plenty of pay per views and title defenses still to come. So you know could could easily double in the you know six months or four, four or five months we got remaining as well. Yeah. Oh, it's it's exciting times, man. It shows you how hard it is to hold a belt. Yeah, well, it's you know, it's like um, it's like a second or third wind in the evolution of MMA. You know, like there was the first wind, which everyone got to see play out in the first sort of twenty UFC events, and then there was like a huge second wind, which sort of happened after that, where everyone caught up, and now it's happening again, where people are branching off, doing different training techniques and stuff, and you know, different people are coming out of the woodwork. Like Holly Holm has only really looked comfortable in one or two of her fights so far in the UFC and um you know the one that she looked comfortable in was the one where she dismantled Ronda Rousey but since that and before that she you know she looked a little here and there rather than um looking like a world beater yeah that's to me uh it's the way they have marketed the sport and I think the way that they have marketed the sport uh people are going to open their eyes to it fairly shortly you know now they have this ranking system uh top 10 top 15 uh top five contender title challenger i think they're going to have to change that because in reality that just it, to me it doesn't mean anything That's right. to me top 15 is not worth the papers written down on top 15 i think top 50 Top 50 guys on any night could win the belt and beat the champion. I 100% believe that. I 100% guarantee that. Style-wise, styles, guys with certain styles match up well or or with other guys. You know, like they say, connor has been given beneficial style matchups, which is true. The guy is a top, oh, well, he beat top five. He beat Chad Mendes. Uh, Chad Mendes is number one contender. He's earned the title shot. Yeah, but Chad Mendes style-wise is a perfect. I would fight Chad Mendes tomorrow. The guy is a five-foot nugget. Uh, <laughs> he's not touching me. I could do the same thing. I could stab him, stab, kick him in the body, and he's going to fall. Yeah. Like Style-wise, that is not a good fight. Dennis Siva, that's a good fight for me. Mm-hmm. You know, me and me and Connor have a similar style, like... Uh, he is not a good fight for me, but star wise, there are some bad fights. You give him, and then you see uh, a guy like Clay Guida. I think Connor would struggle with Clay Guida, even though a lot of guys would tear him apart. It's it's yeah. it's style wise. Uh, there's good matchups, but they they can put who they want to build up with with good matchups, right. which is. Because, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the matchmakers that are setting the table for the fighters in, in those cases, you know. So, you, you know, like you say, um, giving someone who plays to your strengths rather than someone who's going to be evenly matched with you is, is a benefit from, from the matchmakers, you know, which is placed to your point. Um, you know, what, um, yeah. 
it's definitely I, I think the marketing is becoming well to to a lot of people it's becoming a lot more obvious um, and you know like you say the rankings don't have a lot of relevance to the actual skills as such but they're they're more towards who's marketable and who's going to be next in line for titles but then you have random people jumping into the title scene from time to time as well so it's a tough one to um, sort of judge and probably a tough one to manage from the UFC's point of view yeah because for such a long time they they would market a champion as oh this is the champion he's unstoppable yeah. that's why he's the best in the world but eight new champions in one year they're gonna have to change their approach you know like anyone can be anyone in this sport there's so many ways to win and so many ways to lose uh there's so many different factors involved in the and that's why what that's why we all you know i'll put a prediction down and i'll get i'll get two-thirds of them wrong and people will say oh you're an idiot you don't know anything about the sport and you know i i've dedicated my life to this sport. i spent the last eight years of my life stuck in this sport every day i can't i can't pick 70 percent of these fights right you know but that's the sport like that's why I watch it. That's why we watch it. That's why we all love this sport so much. It's the unpredictability of it. Uh, guy like Nate Diaz, he's, he's truly shown his character. He's shown he can come back from losses. He's shown he's been knocked out. He can he can recover from that. You know, those are the those are the kind of fighters that I'll hedge my bets on and I'll support because they're in it for the long haul. You know. They're not a 10 and 0. Oh, this guy's 10 and 0. He's unstoppable. He's un- if you tell me you're unbeatable, then you're just lying. Everyone is beautiful. You know, I, I'd rather hit my face and follow and support a fighter, win or lose, who has proven he can come back. He's proven a passion from the sport, and he's proven that he can stay, stay motivated. You know, a guy like Matt Brown. You, you know, he's still dangerous. Yeah, he got beat by Alaberga, but he comes back in his next fight. I'm going to watch and I'm going to enjoy with anticipation because I know that he's a dangerous guy. He's a dangerous guy on the feet, and he's always going to push for the win. Whereas a uh, 10-0 guy, you know, he takes one loss, he talks about it, and he can't get over it, and he really crumbles, and it's a completely different story, you know? So I think the marketing of the sport is going to change, and it's going to change uh, in the very short future. Yeah. Oh, well, huge. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, can't argue with anything that you've said, and I think social media is playing a huge part in the downfall and some of of some of those champions as well. Because, you know, as soon as as soon as anything happens in the sporting world, there's a meme about it in minutes. There's like a video <laughs> with big heads about it in hours, and you know, some of that stuff would would definitely play on on some people's minds uh, if they're in a bit of a vulnerable state. Yeah, man, social media is something else. Like, I think it's great. Like, I, I have, uh, it has its benefits. You know, I get guys messaging me with support, but you also get guys testing your, testing your patience. You know, they'll message you out of nowhere, but it's your ability to ignore it. It's your ability to brush it off. You know, someone that's never met you before will say, you suck, you, you know, you'll get knocked out. You're never going to make it, you know, and, it's your ability to kind of water off a duck's back and, and brush that off. It's funny as a fighter because you go through these stages, like you grow up, you haven't learned any any fight skills, you start training and, and people stop messing with you. You know, you become this champion and that champion, you start fighting as a professionally before all the social media and people respect you, you know, they see you as a fighter and and no one says anything to you. No one says, oh, you know, that Dan Hooker, he's a he's an asshole, he's a dickhead. Because they know that you're a better fighter than them. Yeah. Um, then you start getting social media and you start putting yourself online and that starts building up, building up, building up until you get people you don't realize. And then you start getting people you've never, never met before saying you suck or you're a dickhead. And... You're not used to this. It's been three or four years since anyone said anything to you in that manner. 
And now, now you have to start taking that, that kind of stuff again because there is nothing you can do. Um, and I think it is a real test of character to have someone insult you uh, you've never met before. Someone insult you and you, you brush that off. To me, I, I look at it as a test of character, you know. If I was to react and uh, insult them back, then that's, that's a poor choice of character on, on my behalf. If I can kind of brush that off, that that shows my humility and it shows my, you know, I'm I'm not the best in the world. I can't yet, and I can't. You can't win every fight. That's not it's not feasible. But for my for me to brush it off and not accept these kind of things and not let them affect me is a is a positive uh, reflection of my character. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. I like, agree with what you said. Very wise words. Um, must be very hard when you've got, like you say, just people you've no idea about, never met, have no affinity to you, just coming at you um, in all sorts of random ways. So absolutely, it, it is a test of your character and it's a testament to the sort of person you are to just let that stuff roll off your back because, you know, there are definitely a lot of fighters that don't let that sort of stuff slide. So, um, you know, it's great to see. Well, Dan, that's about it. Unless you got anything else you want to chat about? Nah, just uh, shout out Tiger Muay Thai for looking out, of, looking after me. Uh, all the young fighters or fighters coming up in New Zealand, man, stay at it. Uh, you are the best in the world. Yeah. You know, we got we got the best trainers in the world. We got the best training partners in the world. And New Zealand MMA, it's 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 gonna be massive. We're gonna have the UFC back here soon. So get your pro record up. Get things going. Um, we're going to be pushing for big things in New Zealand, so uh, get ready for them, man. Nice. Awesome, Dan. Thank you very much for catching up. From the other boys, Lucas and Anadu, thank you for talking to us on Fight Bros. No worries, bro. Have a good one. Catch you later. Okay.